Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's Be Curious Late event. It's bittersweet, and this is sweet bitter, because I am celebrating in style as we start the last in our series of late talks. Indeed, the last event in the Be Curious programme. And to wrap up this calendar of curiosities, we're talking about supporting society, an hour spent discovering research into sexuality, social inclusion, language and identity. Now, identity wise, my name is Dr. Adam Booth and I'll be your host for tonight. I myself am based in Leeds School of Earth and Environment and I'm a geophysicist, which means I'm pretty much interested in finding things buried in the ground beneath your feet. It also means that I don't really have any formal training in sociology, linguistics and inclusivity, so I'm just as curious as you are to find out more. This evening's event is part of Be Curious, which is the University of Leeds' annual research open event, where we invite you to take a peek at what goes on inside a university. Over the last two weeks, Be Curious has presented activities and events to educate and entertain you, to explore the stuff that university researchers get up to, and to explain how it impacts our day-to-day -day lives. The programme featured live talks and hands-on events, and many can be found through the University of Leeds YouTube channel, so do have a browse and retrospectively join in the fascinating fun. So, back to tonight. As I say, we'll be exploring ideas of identity and inclusivity with the help of a fantastic lineup of our three researchers. Joining us are Aidan Greatrick, Dr. Fiona Douglas, and Dr. Drasco Castellan. Each speaker has a 10 minute slot to tell you about an area of their research. After that, it's over to you for some questions. If you have a question for a speaker, just post it in the chat. And in fact, let's give it a try now. Give us a hello, tell us who you are, where you're joining from, and our moderator team will be keeping an eye on the chat and they'll be sure to say hi back to you. You should see you should see the chat function just to your right if you are viewing this event in YouTube. And if you're not viewing it in YouTube, then we'd recommend clicking the option to join it in YouTube and then you'll get the best experience out of this event. So first up, we are welcoming Aidan Greatrick to discuss the issues that sexual identity can raise for inclusivity. Aidan is a PhD researcher and a project officer in Leeds School of Geography, aiming to promote inclusive practice for LBTQ plus workers. This is definitely a big issue in my own practice at the moment, where as lecturers, we're actively trying to learn and be inclusive of the needs of an increasingly diverse student body. So I'm very keen to hear this talk and hopefully get some tips for my own field practice. So um, Aidan, if you're ready, it's over to you. Hi, Adam. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, yeah, it's lovely to be here with you all today. And so this uh, presentation that I'm giving today is about this project that I work on called uh, Pride in the Field, which is aiming to promote inclusive fieldwork practices for LGBTQ plus people. Um, so LGBTQ plus people, they are lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, queer, intersex, um, anything in between. Um, people and the focus of this research on their fieldwork practices is to try to address some issues around safety, inclusivity that LGBT researchers face in the field. So you may be wondering what David Attenborough has got to do with this. So obviously David Attenborough is a very well-known and highly respected natural historian. He's traveled all over the world teaching millions about the natural world and how it is under threat from climate destruction. His work is hugely influential, but what I want us to think about now is what would his career have been like if he was part of the LGBTQ plus community? Do you think, given his profile, that he would find it easy to work in parts of the world that may criminalize homosexuality? What additional precautions would he have had to take in order to be safe in the field? So you may be thinking, why are these questions important? Well, field research provides a whole range of opportunities for people, for science, for research. Being involved in field work can lead to new discoveries, can help raise awareness of pressing issues and inform the public about other cultures, events and situations. So it makes sense then that we would want field work to be inclusive. We'd want everybody to be able to contribute to this work. The more people who are free and safe, to be involved in field work, the more likely it is that we will make new discoveries and find innovative solutions to the challenges that we face. But sadly, this is not always easy. Field work can be a very difficult and dangerous thing, even for those who have certain privileges, like Sir David, 
He is a white, straight British man with a good passport. And these things will make fieldwork easier for him to navigate than is the case for other people. It's not often you would get a side-by-side -side comparison between myself here and David um, Attenborough, but uh, I'm sharing a picture of myself here now uh, carrying out field research in Istanbul, in Turkey. Uh, pictured here with a street cat in its natural habitat, but don't worry, I am not a natural um, historian, nor am I famous like David Attenborough. I am just a humble human geographer who researches migration, focusing on LGBTQ plus asylum in Europe and the Middle East. But I'm also a gay man with my own set of privileges. I am white, I'm British. Before COVID, I didn't know what travel restrictions were really. I was able to go anywhere I liked pretty much. Unlike many millions of people who live in places where it's very difficult to get visas or rights to, to travel. However, as a gay person conducting field research, I do have to think very carefully, like many other LGBTQ plus researchers, about my own safety in field contexts, especially when carrying out research in places where I might encounter homophobia or other forms of abuse or violence. For example, uh, the Turkish government, uh, when I was conducting field research in 2016, um, had become increasingly hostile towards LGBTQ plus people. And so the photo on the left here shows this massive pride march that took place in Istanbul in uh, 2014. And it was sadly also one of the last times such a congregation of people um, emerged in Istanbul in support of LGBTQ plus rights. Since then, uh, and including when I was in Istanbul, up until now, pride marches have been suppressed, LGBTQ plus activists have been arrested and detained, some of them killed. Um, so there's clearly an issue here around how safe it is to be in a place where the government is actively clamping down on the rights of LGBT people. In 2016, I went to try and see if the march would go ahead. There were talks that it would happen, but sadly, the government had very heavily suppressed the, the gathering. A lot of people were arrested. And in order to protect myself as a field researcher, I decided to sort of vacate the area to try and like make myself hidden or to keep discreet. But this still didn't work. I was approached by a police officer who asked me straight up if I was gay and what it was that I was doing in Istanbul. And I was, you know, incredibly alarmed by this. It was the first time in my life that I had faced the threat of arrest or the, the scrutiny of police officials because of my sexuality. I was asked to produce some ID and it was at this point that I produced my British passport. And the officer sort of looked at this and realized that really there was very little that he could do in terms of intimidating a British citizen in comparison to what had been happening to Turkish citizens who were LGBT that day. And so I wanted to share this example because it highlights some of the issues that LGBTQ plus people face in the field, but also how these aren't uniform. I am a gay person, but the threat that I faced from detention or arrest was going to be different from the threat of detention or arrest that another gay person may have faced in that same situation because of my citizenship. I think in this case, it applies beyond field work too. And I'm gonna to ask you now to think about planning a holiday or going abroad. LGBTQ plus people have often had to take additional precautions to think about their own safety, how to um, moderate their behavior in order to be safe in the places that they visit. So in order to open this out a little bit, I wanted you to post some things in the comments. Um, if you've ever had to consider uh, your safety uh, when traveling, um, if you've ever had to think about changing your behavior when you interact with people when on holiday in order to keep yourself safe. What other things have you had to think about? If you would like to write some things in the comments, then we can come back to these uh, later, but just to try and get us thinking about these things here. I think what I'm hoping that this will do is, is to encourage you to think about the issues that LGBTQ plus researchers have to always consider before field work. And if we're considering these things, there's also another question. Shouldn't universities, shouldn't institutions, shouldn't organizations also be thinking about these questions? How can organizations and universities be more proactive in addressing the challenges that LGBTQ plus researchers face? And I think this is the point of our project. Pride in the field is seeking to address 
the challenges that LGBTQ plus researchers face and calling for institutions, universities to be more proactive in addressing and supporting LGBTQ plus researchers to face these challenges. And so we are partnered with a fantastic organization called the LGBTQ plus Field Network. And this was set up by two biologists after one of the founders, Sarah, experienced anti-gay violence and discrimination when carrying out research on primates in Uganda. So like David Attenborough, Sarah had a deep passion for conservationism. She had the expertise and the skills to protect endangered wildlife. But after this experience and without the support from her institutions or research teams, she considered giving up on it entirely and leaving the profession. But she didn't, she stuck it out and she founded the LGBTQ plus field network in order to create a safe space for LGBT researchers, to share resources, to find a community that we can come together around in order to prevent people being pushed out of field work, pushed out of opportunities. And it's at this point that Pride in the Field is supporting LGBTQ plus field network to bring expert knowledge from across disciplines um, about the experiences and challenges that LGBTQ plus researchers face so that we can develop tools, resources, insights to inform advocacy efforts to help better support organizations and communities um, who, who conduct or are involved in, in overseas field research. So in tackling some of this, we're working to promote safe spaces um, for LGBTQ plus researchers in field settings. Uh, this also includes online safe spaces. For example, the platform that we've developed, a digital platform, which will allow researchers to share resources and information to help them find support in the field. Information will help people to know their rights, which is, I think, really important, and to plan accordingly in order to avoid greater risk in the field. And we're also developing tools and resources, as I said earlier, to help institutions to be more proactive in addressing the risks LGBT researchers face. I think here it's really important to emphasize that some of the research that we did found that even in risk assessments, the specific challenges that LGBT researchers were not addressed, often there's an implication that that risk, rather than it being addressed by the institution, is taken on and born on the shoulders of students, LGBT students, LGBT researchers by themselves. And I think that needs to change. Pride in the field also raises important questions about inclusion. And sometimes being LGBTQ plus inclusive can be all about making LGBTQ people more visible. But in field contexts, as we've seen in you know, some of the examples I've talked about already, this isn't always the answer. Sometimes you need to keep things secret. You need to be discreet. You need to stay in the closet, so to speak, in order to protect yourself. Yet there isn't support, for example, with some of the emotional or uh, 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 mental implications of that that universities could quite easily offer, for example. So I think when we are thinking about LGBTQ plus inclusion, we need to think about people's different experiences and acknowledge that visibility might be a privilege for some that carries different risks for others. So in my experience in Istanbul, for example, the risks I faced for being visibly gay were minimized by the fact I had a British passport. For other people in the same situation, that might not be the case. They may face arrest. So because of this, I think it's important to think about inclusivity as a way of meeting people where they are. It should not be about expecting LGBTQ plus people to be a certain way or to assume that LGBTQ plus people will all face the same challenges, just like we each make individual decisions about what we do when we plan a holiday. Um, there needs to be an approach to inclusivity that is flexible, that is adaptable, that meets people where they are. But it's also, I think, about affirming the right of students and staff to be involved in field research and creating structures of support that are proactive, that make people feel welcome so that decisions about whether or not you should leave the profession, whether or not you should abandon field work, are less likely to happen in the careers of LGBTQ plus researchers. And so finally, here are some of the next steps of the project. Um, and I'd love to talk about this more in the conversations afterwards. And if you do have any questions as well, feel free to contact me because this is 
hopefully going to be a collaborative process where we want to bring people on board. So if you do have questions about inclusive fieldwork practices, if you're designing um, a, a fieldwork module and you want some insights in this, then we'll be able to share tools and resources with you. Um, so that's really the focus now for us is to sort of take the initiative to, to build on the, the experiences that people have shared with us, the expert knowledge that we've curated over the course of the project, and to, to deliver a set of tools, resources, insights to help institutions to address this. Um, and that's pretty much summed up there in, the, in, in this slide. And finally, here's some information um, if you'd like to follow our par partner on um, Twitter, LGBTQ plus Field Network, you can find them there. And we also have a fantastic blog series supported by Geography Directions on um, LGBTQ plus inclusive field work. So do check some of that out. And I think some links will be posted um, shortly or I'll post them once I figure out how. Um, but yeah, thank you very much. That's the end of my talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aidan. Uh, wherever you sat, give him a round of applause. Thank you very much for those uh, really awesome insights, Aidan. It was uh, really fascinating. And indeed, uh, there are comments and uh, questions in the chat that uh, testify to exactly that. Um, I thought I'd just pick up on a few of the responses to uh, the question you asked about, um, you know, how do people uh, prepare for their own overseas trips? And so um, there was Sadie from Otley who says that as a woman, I think about who I interact with. I'm more wary of traveling alone, but also aware that um, I do have privileges as a white British woman. Um, there you go, Sadie's comment there. Um, from Benjamin Jackson, um, as a gay person, I have to consider the way I'm dressed or what signals I'm giving off, as well as the safety of accommodation like Airbnbs that are privately managed, uh, never know the attitudes of hosts, which I think resonates very closely with, with what you were saying there. Um, now, there's a question from Sadie, uh, which uh, actually, she read my mind, that um, could the work and the risk assessments that you are doing be utilized by other businesses and organizations beyond the university um, as an example of, of good and best practice? Yeah, that's a great question, Sadie. I think that's definitely the aim. Um, often these conversations can be very university centric, but that shouldn't be the point. You have researchers, activists, academics who don't just exist in, in um, university settings and are creating innovative solutions to challenges in you know, organizations outside of universities. And the issues they face at their LGBTQ are gonna be just as important as the ones that academics in funded research projects might face or students at universities. And so the, the key aim of the project is through the LGBTQ plus field network, which is not an academic organization it is a it is an advocacy organization through them and their network to be able to work with other organizations um, in the third sector in the charity sector who carry out research projects who work on lgbtq plus issues who do equalities and diversity training as well for example sharing resources with in the uk stonewall things like this um, just to try and make sure that the research is having the most impact that it can um, because certainly research experience is not limited to universities and, and we, it would be important to recognize that. So that's a great question. Thank you, Sadie. Great. Um, I did have one. You mentioned sort of, um, you know, lots of, um, you know, overseas examples of fieldwork. I was wondering um, how safe would fieldwork in the UK be perceived? Because obviously it's not only overseas um, places that, that have issues with um, the LBTQ plus community. Maybe there are areas in the UK where it could be challenging. Yeah, I mean, certainly that's something I've experienced in my own PhD research. Not mm. myself facing homophobia or anything like that, but speaking with participants um, who have had to uh, be strategic in how they present themselves when turning up to interviews. So, I mean, COVID has just challenged so many of my assumptions about where it is and is not safe to be gay where mm. it's not safe to be gay. I was speaking to one participant who is a volunteer for an LGBTQ plus charity. That's what he does. But he also lives at home with his uh, fairly conservative parents. And so doing an interview with him on, on Skype, I was having to do some of those things that I'd do if I was doing interviews with LGBT activists in, in, in some places in Turkey, for example, where we mm. use human rights rather than LGBT rights because there's a need to be discreet about these things. So it's definitely the case that this has broader applications. Like we shouldn't forget, uh, we shouldn't just assume that everything is fine and good in the UK mm. when we're talking about LGBTQ plus inclusive field work, definitely. Um, because these same decisions have to be made even if you're 
planning a trip to some parts of the UK as well. I mean, that, that's, I won't act the way I act in certain parts of London if I'm going to where I grew up, for example. Mm. So these same, these same decisions affect us wherever we are, whatever spaces we're in, yeah. and they apply uh, pretty universally, I think. Excellent stuff, Aidan. Uh, thanks very much. Um, what I would say to anyone out there is that uh, there are links that have been posted into the chat window for links for uh, Pride in the field. You'll also find Aidan on Twitter and uh, do reach out to him if, you, um, if you've if you got any questions or, uh, or want to contribute to any of the research. But again, wherever you're sat, please give him a round of applause. And our next speaker, um, I'm pleased to welcome uh, Dr. Drashko Kastelan, who will be looking at ideas of being bilingual. Now, I guess I've always assumed that being able to speak a couple of languages, multiple languages, is nothing but advantageous. But as I think we'll find, it does present some challenges to speakers. Drashko is a researcher on Leeds' CubeX project, which aims to quantify the experience of those bilingual speakers. Um, so I'm sure you'll tell us more about the CubeX project in the next 10 minutes or so. So um, Drashko, if you're ready, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Uh, I would first like to uh, thank you for the invitation uh, and also for all your hard work in organizing Be Curious. Um, so today I'm going to tell you something about uh, the things that we can learn about the diversity of bilingual profiles when we try to quantify bilingual experience in children. And in particular, I would like to talk about who is bilingual, and I'll talk a bit also about language mixing. But before I get onto that, I would like to acknowledge the rest of the Quebec team, uh, which is based at several universities, uh, not just in the UK, but also in France and the Netherlands, and uh, the amazing Professor Cecile Decat, who's leading us all in this project. So who is bilingual? Uh, this can be quite a hard question to answer. Uh, and in research, as well as in kind of real life, uh, this question is something that can cause discussion among people and also disagreement based on how conservative someone's views are of what a bilingual is. So I would like us to look at some scenarios here. So in the first one, we have Jordi, who's a 12-year-old uh, living in Barcelona. He's been exposed to Catalan and Spanish from birth, and he almost always uses Catalan in his daily life, but Spanish is occasionally used with some friends. I think that for this scenario, we could all easily agree that yes, Jordi is bilingual. In the second scenario, we have Lina, who's a nine-year-old living in India, in New Delhi, and she's been exposed to Marathi and English from birth, to Telugu since the age of three, and to Hindi since the age of five. Uh, now she mostly uses English and Hindi, but uh, only sometimes Telugu and Marathi is not really used anymore. In case of Lina, um, it kind of is something that I think most people would agree that yes, indeed, she's bilingual, or in this case, case actually multilingual, uh, although I do note that in the field, often we use the term bilingual as a general term, no matter whether we talk about two languages or people who speak three languages or more. But here we have an interesting scenario of Luca, who's a 16-year-old living in Dubrovnik in Croatia, and he's been exposed to Croatian essentially his whole life since birth. Uh, but at the age of eight, he started learning English in school, something about one or two lessons a week, uh, and uh, he uses Croatian basically all the time. Nevertheless, uh, English is sometimes used when he communicates in, in, with tourists, especially because he lives in Dubrovnik, which is, a, 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 as we might know, a very touristy destination. In case of Luca, it might be a bit harder to determine whether he's bilingual or not. But then also there is a question as who is to say that, who is to decide this? Uh, so yes, I would say that Luca is bilingual because he can use two languages uh, and he has a certain knowledge of two languages. However, this is something where people might disagree uh, on whether they would call him bilingual or not, no matter whether it's because uh, he didn't get the exposure to English since birth or since early on, or because his level of English is maybe not the same as the level of a native speaker, or maybe even for some people that look at this more in a more conservative way because he learned English in a classroom which is not really the most naturalistic setting to acquire a language. However, uh, when we ask then the question of who is bilingual, we see all of these factors that kind of uh, become important in terms of determining bilingual profiles uh, or kind of specifying bilingual profiles. Interestingly though, uh, the disagreements not only exist in the field, but also they can exist within the same household. So here I'm going to show you an example of a child responded from our recent study. 
Uh, and in this interview with this kid, he was filling in the online questionnaire that we built. Uh, the kid lives in South Africa, and when he was asked to list all the languages that he speaks and or understands, he listed Shitsonga, English, and Afrikaans. So he listed three languages. In a separate session, we interviewed his mother, and his mother was answering question about that same kid. Uh, and when she was asked to list all the languages that he speaks and or understands, she listed only Shitsonga and English. So uh, based on this, we see that the mother and the child in the same household have a different perception about the, the so as to say, language status of the child. Is he bilingual or multilingual? At this point, when they were filling in the languages or rather listing the languages, they didn't know that the questions that are going to come up are about the exposure and use in each language in different contexts. For example, at home with each person, at school or at a daycare, in the local community, uh, during holidays or during various activities. They also couldn't predict that they will be asked about the child speaking, understanding, reading and writing in each language. So for this first uh, case of looking at exposure and use of the child at home, there wasn't a problem in terms of reporting when the parent and the child were reporting the situation about the child's experience, essentially because at home, uh, the child uses Shitsonga and English most of the time, and both of these languages were listed by both the parent and the child. However, in the school context, when they were asked about the languages that the teachers use when they speak to the child, the child uh, indicated that Shitsonga is not used at all, that English is used about two thirds of the time and Afrikaans is used about one third of the time. However, uh, when the mother was asked the same question about the school context, she realized that she actually should have maybe listed Afrikaans because in school they use both English and Afrikaans. Because she didn't list it early on in the questionnaire, uh, she didn't have it as an option here. So uh, as I said already, Shitonga is not used in the, in the school and the place where they live. So she, she essentially reported that English is being used by the teachers all the time. And here we see that when we try to document bilingualism, it really depends on who we interview, whether we get this information directly from the child or from their caregiver. But not only that, it also matters how the caregiver and the child perceive whether the child is bilingual or trilingual in this case. As the child listed Afrikaans as one of his languages, he was also asked to do a self-assessment of his skills on a four-point scale going from hardly at all to very well. And he indicated that his speaking, understanding, and writing in Afrikaans is not very well, but that his reading skills are pretty well. Uh, and in this context, we essentially see that the child does have some significant knowledge of Afrikaans and that Afrikaans is present in his life. So he was quite right in specifying that this is one of the languages present in his life, in his life one of the languages that he speaks and or understands. So uh, following this evaluation study and these interviews, we kind of modify the question that we ask. So essentially what we added to the first uh, question was, so please list all the languages that the child speaks and or understands no matter how well or how often. And below you see the version in the child questionnaire. And by doing this, we, we are hoping that essentially we will kind of encourage not just parents, but also any type of respondent to list languages that are present in the child's life no matter the degree of presence. Um, but this leads us to something that in the field we also call passive bilingualism. So in the case of the child, in the case study of the child that we just looked at, we kind of had this uh, issue of whether the child is perceived as a bilingual or a trilingual. But sometimes when we talk about two languages, if we imagine a, an Urdu English bilingual living in the UK, we can have the following scenario. So we have a nine-year-old kid who's exposed to Urdu from birth and to English from the age of three. But since he started school, he uses English most of the time. And even when the parents speak to him in Urdu, he responds in English. So in this case, we essentially have a situation of a child who's what we would call in the field functionally monolingual. Essentially, he uses English uh, almost all the time. And even when the parents uh, talk to him in Urdu, he responds in English. Uh, nevertheless, he still has an understanding of Urdu because he can understand what his family is telling him. And this last point is also quite interesting. And that leads me to the second thing I would like to briefly address today is language mixing. So this situation where one speaker speaks in one language and another speaker then responds in another would be an example of what we call language mixing or in more, more technical terms in the field code switching. 
apart from language mixing happening between the speakers, it can also be done by a speaker in a single utterance, for example. So here I have some examples from Spanish and English, uh, bilingual. And in a case of a one word switch, this could be something like pasame los shoes or uh, pass me the shoes. Uh, we can also have a several word switch like put the keys and the groceries in la mesa or on the table. Or we can have the bilingual say one sentence in Spanish, for example, podemos ir ahora, meaning uh, we can go now, and then the next one in English, but I would like to stay a bit longer. Uh, so this is something that is quite common across bilingual and multilingual communities across the world. And language mixing is indeed something that research shows seems to be the most natural thing for, for many bilinguals, although it happens to a different extent. And in terms of documenting bilingual experience and trying to kind of get into how diverse bilinguals are in this respect, it's really hard for both parents and children to report this. Uh, and two reasons that I list uh, here for this are the following. So one of them could be the negative attitudes that people normally have about language mixing. And I believe that this stems to some respect uh, from kind of the purest approach to languages and also believes that uh, about if child mixes two languages, they will never properly acquire either of the two, uh, which research doesn't really support. In fact, research shows that even when bilinguals mix two languages, this doesn't happen in a random way. They still follow some linguistic structure and there are models that explain this quite nicely, even though no one teaches these rules from the kids. Essentially, what research seems to suggest is that they pick up the, the, the rules, so as to say, from their communities or community norms. So they switch in the way that their community switch, switches. Uh, the second reason, um, so just to kind of link to what I said before, uh, these negative attitudes towards language mixing might lead parents then and also children to underreport what's actually happening. And indeed, in one of the interviews we recently conducted, the parent was telling us about how they switch in the house uh, all the time, but without knowing that they will ask about this. And later on, when we ask about language mixing, the parent kind of decided to, to say that they don't really do it. Uh, forgetting that they already stated that they do. Um, and another problem why mixing is quite hard to document is because often it is an unconscious process. So because this is so natural to many bilinguals, uh, they don't necessarily recall how often they do it. So we have now a bit of an issue when we try to document bilingual experience in relation to language mixing, because how, can, how well can a questioner really do this? And this is an empirical question, right? But in order to answer this question, we clearly need to have a tool that includes questions about language mixing. And this is something that in the QBEX project we're trying to do. So we created a questionnaire with consultation with over 100 researchers, speech and language therapists and teachers who work with bilinguals. And we created an online tool that has seven modules or seven parts. So we asked them about background information, about risk factors, about language exposure and use, about proficiency in each language, about activities that indicate richness of their linguistic experience, about attitudes, and also about language mixing. Uh, this matrix is quite uh, a lot to process, so no need to read all of this uh, now, but uh, essentially each module uh, has sub-modules and professionals who use them, so researchers, speech and language therapists, or teachers, and pick and choose what they are distributing to the kids that they work with in order to build their profile. So whatever they're interested in, they can pick and choose. Uh, what's nice about this questionnaire is that uh, it's uh, completely free to use. Uh, it's an online questionnaire, and it will be released in English by the end of this month. But apart from English, in the next few months, we are also going to work on translation in all of these languages. And from some work with the colleagues around the world, uh, we believe that there are going to be even more languages coming. And we think that this is really worthwhile because by creating this tool that is free and, and easy to access to everyone who has the internet and the computer, which unfortunately still discriminates against, against certain, certain communities that don't have access to this, but providing this to, to, to a large population uh, out there of bilinguals, we believe that it will be a very useful tool for professionals to kind of get a grasp of children's bilingualism and, and build their profiles in a more nuanced way than just treating bilingualism as a binary category. So you're either bilingual or you're not. It is important to acknowledge that bilinguals are all different, and multilinguals are all different, and that we need to look into more nuanced detail in terms of their profile in order to, to see which areas are 
kind of indicators of potential issues, which areas are indicators of potential advantages, and how we can help these kids as they develop. If you're interested in the project, I encourage you to visit our website, uh, which is kind of in a shabby state at the moment, but it's getting an upgrade by the end of this month. Uh, and apart from resources for uh, practitioners and researchers, there is also going to be a page for parents with resources for parents. So yeah, um, I hope you find it useful. Thank you. Thanks very much, Trashko. Wherever you are, extend a round of applause to him, please. And uh, thanks very much for all the comments that you've been dropping into the chat. Um, it's amazing, actually, because that idea of um, language mixing has kind of given me a name for what was going on in some of my own field work, where I was working in Brazil, and the Brazilian colleagues couldn't understand my English. But when I spoke to them in my broken Spanish, they understood me, and then they could reply in English. And we actually had a pretty good conversation in that way. And it was it was amazing. Like, the, yeah, it was an amazing tool to be able to, to, to navigate that, that landscape. Um, there was a question, though, that was dropped in the, uh, the chat there and um, from um, Sadie, which is concerns this issue you raised about when, um, when parents and children or carers or teachers have a different account of, of bilinguality. So um, Sadie says that, is there any way of making this kind of an activity or a discussion that parents and children's uh, pa parents and their children can can explore together? Um, you know, and, and maybe they could be observed in so doing, and someone else judges their bilinguality, something like that. Of course, yeah. I mean, this depends, of course, on the, the if you're doing, for example, research on this and you want to observe this. It depends on the methods that you implement. But this is why, in this question that we built, we didn't just want to consult the experts and then create this tool and say, "Here mm. it is; it's ready to be used." Once we created kind of a first draft of the tool, we conducted these interviews, cognitive interviews, with both kids and parents to kind of observe them as they're filling it in to prompt them with questions and ask them essentially to tell us what they're thinking as they're answering these questions. And that actually helped us a lot kind of understand how they conceptualize these things that us researchers take for granted, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and using that data and then the information from the observations and from the interviews, we, we try to improve the tool as much as possible because as, as, you, as you might have figured, the tool will be something that they will be filling in on their own in future. So we hope that these modifications we made based on the, the interview observations will be helpful in that sense. Mm, yeah. And the end users of something like that, they could be um, people helping um, with integration in society or things like that, or, or what other kind of end users might there be? Right. Well, we find that this will be really useful for practitioners, right? Uh, especially to those who work with uh, bilinguals. And here in the UK, the term that is normally used for them is EAL. Uh, mm -hmm. And we know that about a fifth of the primary school population are actually bilingual kids. So we believe that using this questionnaire uh, can help teachers actually create the profiles of the child, identify in which areas uh, there might be some issues and kind of work from there in terms of seeing where the child needs additional support rather mm. than just listing this kid, okay, this kid is bilingual and we treat them all in a similar way, give them the same or similar resources, which won't really work because each bilingual kid will have a different profile and have different requirements, right? So that would be one of the, the places where it could be used. Uh, and similar, I guess, also for speech and language therapists because there is one module in particular that kind of flags up what we call risk factors. So in case that is flagged up in bilingual kids that they assess, it's a sign that they should do some additional or follow-up assessments for potential uh, language disorders or any other problem, even though I have to stress this tool is not diagnostic by any means. Right, okay. So it's that um, it, it, it could potentially in that sense be a discriminator between if a child is suffering with dyslexia or something like that, or whether they just don't know that part of the language. Of course, exactly, because bilingualism in itself, there is nothing wrong with it, and not, nothing in bilingualism causes a language a language problem. But obviously, if you think of a child that comes, let, let's say a, a child moves from France to the UK at the age of six, of course that their English can be at the level mm. that we expect if they never had exposure to it. So mm. instead of treating it as a language disorder, this questionnaire, data from this question, can help researchers to realize, oh, this kid was not really exposed to English, so this makes complete sense. But there are some other questions that could indicate this kid might struggle in general with language, no matter which language it is, and that might need further assessment. Yeah, OK. There was one extra question that was actually in the, in the backstage chat of this session, which was talking about how um, sometimes things are just easier to express in one language than another. So some, some languages don't 
simply don't have a word for something. So, you know, the classic one like the Danish Hygur or however you pronounce it. And does, does, the, does your work sort of pick up on things like that, that people have a preference for expressing certain things in one language or another? Well, one of the things that might be slightly related to that is the module that we uh, call the attitudes and satisfaction with the child language. So in this mm. uh, context, we, we ask them a bit about preferred language in different contexts. And we also ask them about their attitudes, about language mixing, for example, also in different contexts to kind of grasp this, in a way, sociolinguistic background of each speaker and then see if that can help us interpret any data we collect about them, for example, about using specific language in specific situations, etc. Uh, mm -hmm. And also we get the, a lot from the language mixing module where we can see, for example, in which context they use only one language, so they behave like monolinguals, and in which context they mix in a free way or freestyle. Mm -hmm. So. Okay, great. Drasko, I think we'll leave it there. So uh, thank you very much. And again, wherever you are, please give him a round of applause. You have all the links to, uh, to Drasko's work, the work of his group in, uh, in the chat boxes there. So please do check it out. Now then, uh, to close this event, I am delighted to welcome Dr. Fiona Douglas to the floor. Uh, Fiona is a lecturer in Leeds School of English and is involved with the Dialect and Heritage Project. Now, I really love a good dialect, but as a lecturer and indeed probably tonight too as a host, I often water down my own Stoke accent to make myself a bit more understandable. I think it helps communicate with people from diverse backgrounds, but it does somehow feel like a little bit of myself dies every time I betray my, my own Stoke heritage roots. So um, hopefully Fiona can share some experiences with me here and maybe make me feel that little bit better about it. Let's find out. Fiona, it's over to you. Thank you very much, Adam. Uh, yes, I very much hope we're going to be celebrating our dialect diversity uh, this evening. Um, I'm going to be asking uh, people who are watching to share their own dialect with us. Um, so I hope as there are some questions come up in the chat, um, you'll be able to respond. Um, so I want to talk to you a little bit about um, why dialect matters, why it gives us a sense of identity, a sense of place, a sense of belonging. But I also want to introduce you to um, quite a new project called the Dialect and Heritage Project um, and give you some details as to how you can get involved. Um, I'd like you, um, if you would please, um, to post your answers um, in the chat as to what you call these things. Um, so starting at top left, um, I'm thinking about that horrible, sticky garden weed um, that uh, you sometimes find. I certainly seem to have lots of them in my uh, garden. Um, I used to call them sticky willies, um, but I have learned since I came to Leeds um, to call them cleavers. I'd be very interested um, if other people uh, call them something else. Um, the uh, creepy crawly, apologies for anybody of a, a squeamish uh, situation at the bottom. Um, one of those creepy crawlies with long spindly legs. Do you have a specific word for those? Um, and the third one I'd like to ask you about just now is um, a moving water course. Um, it doesn't have to be coming downhill. A moving water course that's smaller than a river. Uh, you might have lots of words for those. Um, perhaps you just call it a stream. Perhaps you call it a beck. I see there are quite a few people from Yorkshire joining us um, today. Um, I've learned to call it beck since I moved to Yorkshire. Um, beck is actually an old Norse word, so it goes right back to those Viking invaders. Um, do you call it a brook? Um, maybe even a gill? Um, for me, it's a burn, um, and you probably by now are starting to work out uh, where I might be from. Um, so really, when we're thinking about uh, dialect, it was interesting that Adam started off uh, talking about his, his accent. Um, and of course, accent is part of dialect, but it's not the whole story. Um, so when we think about uh, what dialect is, what we're really often um, describing are forms of speech or forms of writing that mark us out as belonging to specific geographical locations and or particular social groups. So we might be thinking about the words that we use 
um, and I'm asking you to share your words this evening. I'm fascinated by words. Um, I keep learning new words. I've been in Yorkshire for quite a long time now, and I'm still struck by uh, the unfamiliar words that I hear around me. And of course, I share my, my own words back. Um, we can also be talking about uh, grammar. Um, so, for example, when I moved to Leeds at first, uh, we've got um, someone in the, the university in our local office, um, and she um, said something I'd never heard before. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll meet you nine while ten. And I thought, what does that mean? I'd never heard this. Um, fortunately, I kind of worked it out. Um, otherwise, my timekeeping would have been very remiss. Um, and of course, we're also thinking about uh, accent or pronunciation. Um, and everybody has um, an accent. I know sometimes you hear people say, oh, you know, I don't have an accent. Um, what they probably mean is that they don't feel they have an accent that marks them as coming from a particular geographical location. But we all have an accent uh, because we all pronounce words and we all have very different sorts of pronunciations. For me, one of the really important things um, about this, um, alongside the, the fantastic um, variety that we get, is that um, dialect is very closely linked, I think, to a sense of identity, a sense of, of who we are and where we come from and who or what we belong to. Um, so dialect and language more generally can be simultaneously inclusive, but also exclusive. So what do I mean by that? Well, um, I've popped uh, the, the etymology uh, from the Oxford English Dictionary uh, for identity down in the bottom corner, not because I don't think you know what identity means, of course you do, um, but because that it's got a really interesting etymology. Um, so where the word actually comes from, because it comes from Middle French uh, identity, um, and that emphasizes the quality or condition of being the same. So just like our present day English word, identical. Um, so identity is about sameness, but I think identity is equally about difference. It's about people who are like us and people who are very different um, from us. Um, and so probably as you're listening, uh, you're probably uh, thinking whether I be belong to your group or not to your group. Um, and I think we're all making those kinds of judgments um, as we go along. One of the um, other things that's connected to that is that, you know, when we've got this idea of language connected to particular groups of people and a sense of belonging or not belonging, being inside the group or out with the group, um, I might be signaling that I belong to a particular group by doing that. Um, but it can also impose particular linguistic tariffs. Um, so, for example, um, if I said something along the lines of, um, oh, well, she was just a shilpit wee bochel and a right nippy sweetie. Talk about an annoying wee nyaf. Uh, the chances are that perhaps many of you watching this now won't fully understand um, what I'm talking about. And I suspect that many of you um, are deciding on the basis of that, if you haven't already, um, where I might come from um, and subconsciously um, whether you are like me um, or different um, from me. Um, so there are kind of um, consequences, if you like, attached to the sameness or difference. Um, I've got some other words for you to uh, have a think about. Um, so uh, do you know what a blather, skite, cag, mag, chammer, kank, gallivant or jaffock is? They are fantastic words. Um, what about branny spreckles, uh, fern tickles, murfles, and purple pork petals? Um, or uh, cakey, dull, but flambergasted, gommy, moppy, puggled. Um, and I do quite like galley baggers, hodman, dod, moppin, moggy, uh, clinker bells, um, conquer bells, and daglets. Um, so I'd be interested to know if you've got any ideas as to what those words mean. We can have some answers uh, at the end. 
Um, dialect, I think, is about present day diversity, obviously, but it can also be a window on the past. So if we think about it in the present day, we're generally thinking about geography. We're thinking about how our dialect compares to people who are from other places um, around the country um, or perhaps indeed around the world. But we can also look back in time with dialect and think about language through history. Um, because um, Benedict Anderson, um, who wrote a very well-known uh, book um, on imagined communities, um, so he sort of says that, you know, we're, we're in communities because we're people with people around about us, but that that sense of community is also something that is, is inside our heads as well. Um, and he says that nothing connects us effectively to the dead or previous generations. Um, a sense of contemporaneous community, nothing's like it, but language. So there's this sense that language connects back into the past. And I think language and dialect particularly can be incredibly evocative and very, very evocative of the past. Dialect study at the University of Leeds has got a very long um, and distinguished history. Um, many of you may know that already. Um, it goes uh, quite a long way back um, to uh, Harold Orton, um, who set up the Survey of English Dialect. Um, and that ran from the 1940s to the mid 70s. And also later the Institute of Dialect and Folk Life Studies that was set up by Stuart Sanderson. Um, and that ran until the mid, um, the mid 80s. And so we have all this fantastic stuff, um, the outputs from all of these um, long term projects on dialect study and folk life study um, at the university. Um, and at the top, uh, I've put the picture of the Parkinson Tower, which if you're if you're from Leeds, I'm sure you will recognize. Um, and in the Brotherton Library, which sits inside that building, uh, we've got all these fantastic resources. Um, the Dialect and Heritage Project uh, wants to use those resources and make them publicly available um, so that people don't have to um, go to special collections um, and make an appointment to see them uh, because they're absolutely fascinating. Uh, we've got lots of field workers notebooks, we've got lots of audio recordings, we've got fantastic photographs, we've got word maps, we've got all sorts of information on local customs and festivals and so on. Um, so it's absolutely fantastic. Um, the Survey of English Dialects is the best known bit. Um, they went to 313 places, uh, mainly rural around England. They had a huge questionnaire. They asked 1300 questions. Um, and so they collected about 400,000 items of information. And they were really interested um, in language and dialect in particular as a window on the past, because often uh, dialect maintains uh, older forms of the language which have since got lost um, in standard varieties. Um, and Harold Orton uh, was very concerned that dialect was going to change forever after the Second World War as people moved around the country more. Um, and so this was a last ditch attempt um, to collect dialect uh, before people started moving around and having their dialect uh, potentially changed. Um, so it was an absolutely massive survey. Um, they preferred um, to talk to older people um, and they particularly liked old men with good teeth. Um, this is Jimmy Marsden. Um, Jimmy Marsden is what we um, often call a norm. He was a non-mobile older rural male. So they wanted people who hadn't moved around too much. Um, and they particularly wanted men because they were much less likely to correct their speech. Um, you know, in the 1940s and 50s, women tended, if they worked, they tended to be in service in the big houses. Um, and if you were in service, you tended to modify the way you spoke. You put on your, your best accent. Um, they wanted good teeth because um, if your teeth are not in good shape and um, if you've lost some teeth, it affects your pronunciation. So they wanted to get the people's genuine pronunciation not affected by having uh, dodgy dentistry. Um, and they did interview some women. Um, I'm going to play you just a little bit um, from Miss Dibna. Um, and um, I'm sure you will recognise that this is an earlier form of uh, the Great British Bake Off, I guess. Well, first I got a clean bowl. Then I put my floor in. And I put my uh, yeshti rashes in my mother with a bit of sugar. To make it rise better, and I rub some flour, uh, rub some lard into my flour, bit of salt. 
Um, she's uh, talking about baking. She's baking bread. Um, the women did get asked questions about things like um, housework um, and so on. Um, and they collected all this fantastic stuff. Um, and these fantastic word maps um, document different varieties around the country. Um, so the one on the left is um, words that you might have for if you put um, some tea in the teapot or if you put um, a tea bag in the mug nowadays, uh, what do you say you are doing? OK, um, so are you brewing it? Are you making it, mashing it, masking it and so on? Um, the one on the right um, was what they noticed uh, for sweeties. Um, and um, the same lady who introduced me to Nine While Ten uh, remembered her mum using the word spice um, for sweeties too. Um, so we've got all this fantastic stuff. Um, the Dialect and Heritage Project um, wants to take that out, um, give it a public, uh, public audience. Um, and we're working with uh, museums around the country um, and we're going to have some public events um, starting very, very soon. So we're going on tour this summer um, and we are going to collect present day dialect in all its diversity, too. Um, we are not only interested in old men with good teeth, we want absolutely everybody to come and share their dialect uh, with us. The more uh, the merrier, the more different uh, the merrier. So people don't have to have lived in the same place forever. They don't need to be um, of a certain age and they certainly don't need to have particular sorts of teeth. Um, so you can take part. Um, you can follow us on Twitter. Um, there are volunteering opportunities. Um, you can be a dialect field worker and do what um, the, the Survey of English dialect field workers did all that time ago. You can transcribe some present day stuff. You can volunteer. Um, you can help us publicize the project. Um, these are our museums. So we're coming to a museum uh, around the country, potentially near you or where you're going on holiday. Um, and I want to leave you um, with um, a few more dialect questions um, because um, people often ask, is dialect still alive? You know, is dialect dying? That's what Harold Orton was worried about. Um, so what do you call your midday meal? What do you call your evening meal? Um, what is that bready thing? Um, what is a snicket? Is it the same or different from a ginnel? I'm sure the people from Yorkshire have got plenty um, to, to tell me about that because um, I'm still a bit confused. Um, and do you have a word for the pieces of batter that you sometimes get with fish and chips? Um, I've left you on the right hand side um, some possible suggestions. You may have others. Uh, back to you, Adam. Everyone put your hands together and uh, give her a round of applause. Thanks very much, Fiona. And I have to say that there's been some really nice recollections coming up in the, in the chat there. Um, I thought we'd just uh, take a look at some of the answers to the first questions that you posed about what do you call those, the plant, the, the bug, and the, uh, the stream there. So, uh, for example, for the, uh, for the weed, we had goose grass, we had cleavers, we had sticky weed. I'd, I'd just call it a weed, to be honest. Um, shout out to Isabella Topley, who says, annoying plant. <laughs> nice. And then shout out as well to Isabella Topley, for the bug, who says, big spider. <laughs> nice, that'll do. But we've had daddy long legs. Um, my Australian girlfriend definitely doesn't call them daddy long legs, but I just nipped out to see what she does call them, and we couldn't remember. But either way, it's, yeah, confusion there. And then uh, we had shout outs for streams or becks and things like that. So, um, yeah, but equivalently people posting stuff in there do take a look at the chat windows everyone for uh, what you've put about your tea or your dinner or your, your your bread roll or whatever um there was a couple of comments and questions just to just to pick up on um first of all uh moira garland who says that she knows what a gallivanter is um says that um both her dialect and language has changed over the course of her life mainly due to moving around the uk and abroad um now i've heard this expression like dialect chameleons before um as a linguist how hardwired do you think a dialect is and and can it genuinely change or would it revert if you spent time around you, you, your kin or whatever um, I think dialect is malleable. I mean, I don't think um, if you if you leave where you live as a child, you know, at a certain age, you don't ever really lose it entirely. Most of us don't. Um, but I'm with Moira because, you know, I moved to Leeds 18 years ago and I have adopted some Yorkshire words since I came here. So I use Beck. I use Off Cumden uh, to mean an outsider because that's what I am. Um, uh, it's a really old fashioned one, that one, I think. Um, but one of the things we're really interested in in this project is 
yes, the words that people have because of where they were born and grew up and went to school, but also the words that people adopt either as they move around the country uh, with work or, or beyond, um, you know, whether they've got a partner that's from somewhere else. Um, because I do think it's quite interesting which ones we adopt and which ones we don't. So, so yes, it's not static. Hmm. Yeah, and um, I mean, a, a colleague of mine said that um, she couldn't understand me because I'd, been, I'd, I'd got off the phone for, for 10 minutes in a, in a meeting with a colleague and uh, to my parents and for the next few minutes she couldn't understand what I was talking about because I had that reversion but equally in moving up to Leeds um, I've adopted both Ginnell and Snicket but I have to admit I don't know which context they're specifically used in and I know some people would have strong opinions on that so um, yeah I, I've definitely noticed myself picking up the, those terms. Um, there was another question um, posted from, from Sadie you said that um, when you when you talk to people about the, their dialect, do you find that they also have a fierce sense of pride about that their dialect or particular groups more than others, depending on where they're from? Do they really identify it with a sense of local pride, perhaps? Um, I think it depends who you talk to. Um, mm -hmm. so, um, and I do think sometimes it's stronger in some areas of the country than others, as well as in strong some individuals rather than others. Um, so sometimes, you know, you, you get people who are really proud of it. They, they know all about it um, and they're kind of, you know, out and dialect proud, um, which is great. Um, but sometimes um, you meet people who maybe think that it's slang or bad English. Um, and, you know, one of the things the project wants to do is give people access to that dialect heritage, because often mm. these words um, that, you know, really are dialect, but we might think are you know, just bad English or slang or, oh, that's just the way we say it in Glasgow. Um, you know, actually, they've got a really long history. And it's lovely when you're able to explain to people where this comes from and say, you know, do you realise this goes all the way back, you mm. know, to the 16th century or to old English? And people go, oh, wow. Um, because, you know, it's a real sense of, of connectedness and, and kind of it's got a linguistic pedigree. So it's a bit of a mixture. Yeah, that's really interesting. I remember that, you know, my nan used to use expressions that you know she, she'd not not traveled anywhere but it turns out that there's the equivalent word in scandinavian it, it, it's really amazing how that that link is there um with that we, we are basically at time so fiona um thank you very much um there are links to fiona's projects um in the chat so do follow up do contribute to the uh the dialect and heritage projects and uh, indeed give fiona a round of applause thanks very much fiona and that brings us quietly sadly to the end of our um the end of our late night tonight uh, and indeed the end of the be curious program um thank you to all our brilliant speakers aiden graytrick drashko kashkalan and fiona douglas fantastic insight into their research but of course be curious would be nothing without a curious audience thanks a million to you for joining us and putting your questions to our speakers i hope you enjoyed your time with us and if you did you can let us know by tweeting us at unileads engage and using hashtag be curious 21 we'd also really welcome your feedback on tonight's event so please let us know what you thought by filling in the short evaluation form available at the link which is up on screen now um, and indeed, if uh, you um, book the session, you will also receive an email with the link to the evaluation form. And our moderators will also share that link to you uh, for you in, in the chat now. And if this is fired up your curiosity, then I'd also take the opportunity to promote Quantum Source, live research events in a pub coming to Leeds from September. Keep your eyes peeled on the at Quantum Source Twitter and Instagram feeds for all the latest updates. So that's it from us for now, for this year, we will be back. Enjoy the rest of your evening and thanks again for joining us. Stay cool, stay curious. Goodbye.